Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mozonai Wojciewoska, and I'm currently a 12th grade IB student here at Abel High School. And even though the light is bright, I see some familiar faces in the audience. Today, I'm going to be talking about building consensus and the search for mutual cooperation. Now, we've had a lot of speakers, and they've sort of cracked, taken cracks at academic stuff, said that it's not always enough. And while I do agree to some extent, that's not always the case because academic stuff also helps us out. There are student clubs and challenges which really do provide a good academic background. And in my case, I am a part of one of those student clubs and challenges, and I'm sure that you, in your own time, in your own high school, your, in your own activities, face those challenges strongly and with strength. Now, I'm going to talk about a little bit about my club, and you have. So, can I take a quick show of hands to show who's familiar with MUN? Good, good, awesome. Keep calm and MUN on, people. Right, so MUN and the challenge of unity, as I've chosen to refer to it. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Model United Nations, I'll briefly explain. Not too much about the boring stuff, I hope. So, Model United Nations is a student club, duh. And in this student club, students come together and they sit at a table, unsurprisingly, and they act as delegates of countries. They act as delegates of countries, ladies and gentlemen. That's a symbolic measure. Because as people, as students, when we come together at the table and sit down and we act as delegates of the United States, as delegates of the Russian Federation, as delegates of Brazil, China, Rwanda, anything. When we do sit down at that table, we do not speak for ourselves. We do not speak as individuals. We do not speak as the person that we really are, but rather, rather, ladies and gentlemen, the people at that table speak as representatives of the countries. And that's really important, because when you speak as a representative of a country, it means that you have to take into account the best interests of what your nation wants. Because you're there as their representative. You have your own opinion, you can, but you're there to represent your national interests. And MUN, in spirit and principle, is about getting all these delegates, all these wonderful, enlightened people together in the same room to represent different countries and have them discuss their national standpoints to reach a common ground, to reach a global best interest. Because it's not just about what a national fellow wants. It's not just about what the US wants. No, when the US, Russia, Brazil, Rwanda, etc., etc., when they come together and sit down at the same table, it's about what all of them want. And it's about what all of them can achieve together. A very important point in MUN is called lobbying. And I'm sure some of you who've attended a conference know what lobbying is. It's a period of time in which you come together in an informal way with other representatives and try to gather support for your ideas. What you may not know is that lobbying is not only in the formal political sense. There is this thing called local lobbying, so I call it. And local lobbying is the action you take when you go home every day. You open the door, you walk in, and say, hi, sister, hi. And she like runs over and like hugs you. And then your dad walks in. I don't know, my dad's a little bit of a stern man. But when he walks in, he's like, oh, hey, son, did you do your homework today? Did you? Dad, I just got in. Dad, no, did you do your homework? And if I haven't done my homework, he proceeds to tell me that I should go and do my homework. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the concept. Now, after my dad tells me to go do my homework, or to go do my project, or anything, really, that I just got home, I can't have had time to do, when I go after my dad tells me that and talk to my sister or my mother and say, Mom, don't you think that dad's being a little unfair? 
Because I just got home, and he's already telling me to go and do my homework. But I just got home. I want some time to rest. And the moment, ladies and gentlemen, the moment your mom says, yeah, I think your dad's being unfair. I'll go talk to him about it. That moment is vocal lobbying. Because you have just, in an informal manner, spoken to someone about a belief of yours and asked for support in that belief. That is what local lobbying is. I'm sure each one of you right now is sitting next to at least some friends of yours. So if you turn to your friend and look at them, you'll, you'll notice that at some point in your relationship with each other, you have both taken part in local lobbying. You've both asked each other for support, and you both received it, hopefully. Now, I'm standing alone, just a little speck. And I show you this picture to make it, make it clear that when you're standing alone, your background is a white screen. What does that mean? That means that there's no one else supporting you. That means you are standing alone. That means that you do not have the friendly support that you require as a social human being to influence people. You cannot talk to people because you're alone, and they do not support you because you do not talk to them. But now, it's important to note that you do not have to stand alone. As I'm sure some of you have realized, that previous picture was taken from this one. And this is a picture of me and my squad, so to speak, at a conference in Lübeck, northern Germany. But what's important here is not that you see the conference. It's not that you see all these issues that we're discussing. I mean, those are important too, and I will come back to them later. But right here, the important thing is not the conference we're in. It's the group we formed. It's the bonds that we've built with each other. It's the connections that we've made. It's our collaboration, our cooperation, that makes that group what it is, or what it was, since some of us have split up by now. The entire bond in this group was so strong that after a hard day at conference, when one of our 10th grade friends came into the hotel room and said, Damn it, I need to do this homework, and it needs to get sent in by tomorrow. This is an urgent report. Well, of course, we first asked him why he had it done previously. And he replied that, uh, you know, just homework, man. And at that point, our 12th grade friend, if you most some will recognize him, stepped in and was like, hey, I already know those topics. If you want, I can help you finish the report faster. Of course, as you imagine, the 10th grade friend was very, very grateful. But the real spirit there was that this group of people, this group of amazing people, were bonded by mutual support and mutual respect. Sure, we all had fights from time to time, as I'm sure you do with your own friends, but overall, the bond was there. We cooperated with each other. It was collaboration and support, respect, that kept this group going. And you will see that it is the very lack of cooperation, support, and respect that has led to this. One of the previous speakers mentioned Syria as a brief example. He seems to have preempted me, and I'm sad. But the Syrian example is a very clear crisis which results from the lack of cooperation, the lack of collaboration, and the lack of mutual respect and common ground which we can stand on. I'm sure some of you, most of you I hope, recognize the top left picture. It was very famous in the newspapers a couple months ago. With that picture, ladies and gentlemen, the gendarme officer looks down at the kid. Ladies and gentlemen, has the world really come to the point where our lack of cooperation now even takes away the lives of our children. Because if you look at the other pictures, you see the burned out husk of a city. 
You see people, migrants, trying to flee the war-torn zones by the Mediterranean. You see them in a burned-out shell of what their lives used to be. You see them still trying to communicate and to interact with each other because it's necessary for them to survive. These are desperate people, ladies and gentlemen. World don't care. Blood is everywhere. Have we really gotten to the point where the lack of cooperation, the lack of understanding of empathy has led to such violence and bloodshed? Not that this is uncommon in human history, but in an age where we are so interconnected with technology, as was previously mentioned, and where we communicate so extensively with each other, when we open our Facebook or Twitter or Instagram every day and snap off a text message to our friend, when we have the tooltips of technology in our hands, why do we result in violence when our cooperation breaks down? The world don't care. If that's true, ladies and gentlemen, then the world has become a very bad place. Because when these politicians, when these leaders, when these governments that we chose to elect in many cases, when these people come together and try to sit down at a table and try to solve crises like Syria, drought in, drought in uh, Sudan, famine in Somalia, racism in South Africa, these kinds of problems, when they sit down at the table of international diplomacy, truth be told, they can't even really sit down. For those of you who know what I'm talking about, recently, the Syrian crisis was supposed to be discussed at peace talks in Geneva. And the peace talks in Geneva, that was supposed to be a mutual common ground of respect and understanding, eventually was delayed. Why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, the sides could not agree on who should be a part of the conference. A very trivial, trivial issue, some of you might think. Certainly that it is important, but we should not be delaying the resolution to such crises because we could not agree who would sit at the table. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my hope that everyone sits at the table one day and we can discuss civilly such matters like this. Because when, ladies and gentlemen, when we do not understand each other, when we do not take the time to care about each other, when we do not take the time to respect, to understand feelings, to understand opinions, beliefs, causes of actions, we risk the very bloodshed that the world faces today. And that brings me to the necessity of cooperation. Because it's not only in the international sense, and it's not only on your local scale either. As citizens of the world, hopefully global citizens, as our Australian friend in the TED Talk mentioned, as global citizens, we need to understand that the problems we face are beyond any of us individual. The sum is greater than the parts, ladies and gentlemen. Because the sum, the sum can only arise from our mutual cooperation and the common ground that we choose to build for ourselves. Because when we come to the conference table, or when we go to Starbucks with a cup of coffee and our friend named John, when we say, John, how's your day going, man? Or when we say, the delegate of blah, blah, blah thinks blah, blah, blah. When we do say stuff, we ensure to some extent that the other person, the other country, the other side, understands what we as people, as countries, as groups, as organizations want to believe. They understand the reasons for us speaking the way we do. They understand the reasons for our causes for our faith in whatever belief we choose to believe in. And it is absolutely critical that we are at liberty to understand why the other side has done what it has done. Because if we cannot understand the reasons of actions, then we are doomed to repeat them. Only by understanding why something has led to another thing entirely can we hope to resolve 
issues such as Syria. And only by understanding why your friend sent you an angry text the other day can you actually hope to make up with them. What's the first thing you do if, say, Ahmed sends you a text saying, oh, I'm really mad at you, you can just go away, in less polite words. When they do that, your first intuition is to ask, why? What did I do, right? What's, what's the problem here? What did I do that made you angry at me? Let me put it this way. In 10 years from now, 10 years is a very long time. In 10 years from now, high school is a thing of the past. College, for most of you, unless you go on to postdoctoral studies, is a thing of the past. Maybe even master's doctorates is a thing of the past. And you will most likely find a job. Because, you know, hopefully we all will. And in that job, it could be any job, but in some jobs, when you walk into the workplace, you sit in a cubicle. For those of you who don't know what a cubicle is, which is a funny word in itself, a cubicle is a space enclosed by four walls. And there's this little gateway through the fourth wall through which you enter your cubicle. And that's your workspace. That cubicle belongs to you as a worker, as the individual. But you have nothing outside of that cubicle. So in 10 years' time, you're studying, you've finished your studies, my apologies, and you're working in a cubicle, and you stand up at the end of your day, you look around, and you don't see anyone waving you goodbye. You don't see anyone saying, hey, Matt, you want to go get some coffee? You don't see anyone saying, hey, Joe, you want to go for some pizza? No. Why? Because you didn't take the time to understand people. You didn't interact with people. You failed to forge that support that you need as a social human being. And when you stand up from the cubicle and you look around and see no one, eventually you're going to find yourself wishing life was better. So when you stand up from that cubicle in 10 years, and you look around and see some friends, Rachel, Jonathan, Benjamin, etc., and you go out for coffee with them, Starbucks, and you talk about your daily problems. When you're talking about your daily problems, you feel that other people understand you, right? They're there for you. You can talk to them. They're there to support you. And that makes you happy. Why? Because when you fall down, when work is tough, when your wife divorces you, or when you've tripped and bruised your knee, even something as simple as that, when you fall down, the people there behind you your squad, so to speak, pick you right back up. Yeah, they give you a hand, say, you're all right, man, and just pick you back up. And they take care of you. And that's important. Because cooperation necessitates that we try to empathize with each other. And that goes for every example that I've given you, ladies and gentlemen. Because it could be crises such as Syria. It could be crises like drought and Sudan, could be famine, racism, etc., etc. Could be the end of the world, for all we care. It could be an international crisis, such as those, or you could be a fight with, you had with your best friend. I mean, if I had a fight with Khan, my best friend, I'd feel pretty damn sad. But in the end, in any case you look at, as social beings, as beings that are constantly in a state of interaction with each other, you'll find that if you are cut off, if you are isolated from the ones who support you, from the people, the countries that support you, you will find yourself at a loss at what to do. Because though you may believe in something, you won't have anyone to keep you going. You'll be doing it for yourself, and many individuals have accomplished much. But again, if we all band together, odds on we're going to make a much, much larger effect on the world. And that is why cooperation is necessary, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.